Hi, I would like to start off by thanking the staff for coordinating IAQ Conference, Queen's University for hosting, and my fellow colleagues for sharing their invaluable insights on their research. My name is Talia Stein, and I'm halfway through my undergrad degree in public policy at Carleton University. I'm speaking to you all the way from the lively city of Jerusalem, as I'm here on my gap year, working with Palestinians in solidarity work with an organization called Rabbis for Human Rights. I'm living and working in a part of a country where religious Jewish law presides over life events like marriage and divorce. Here in Israel, there's no other way to obtain a divorce other than by with the guidance of an Orthodox rabbi. And as you know, this is not the case in Canada. In Canada, anybody can obtain a divorce without the presence of a certain religious actor. I think it's quite fitting that I'm presenting to you my research on Jewish divorce from a location that carries this kind of geographic relevancy to my research project. Now, before I present my research topic, define terms, identify problems, pose my research question, or even propose solutions, I'd like to start off with an anecdote that frames my research quite nicely. So picture this. It's May 4th, 2014, in Vancouver, British Columbia, and I'm only six months into my 13th year of life, and I'm leading the Jewish coming-of-age ritual known as a bat mitzvah. So my synagogue, Temple Shalom, is filled with friends, family, old acquaintances, and other members of the community. On a day in which I can only remember reciting my Torah portion with extremely clammy hands, I just recently learned that another Jewish milestone was completed that day as well. At my bat mitzvah, my rabbi agreed to officiate a family member's divorce 40 years after their civil divorce. How could that be? How could it be that a person could be divorced in two different ways? And how could it be that my family member waited so long to receive this alternate divorce? My research on Jewish divorce has led me to conclude that the divorce process of a Jewish person is not as clear nor is it as readily available as its secular counterpart. When referring to Jewish divorce, I will use the Hebrew word get. In order to be considered divorced in the Jewish context and under Jewish law, known as halakha, the male spouse must grant the woman spouse a get. The implications of a Jewish spouse, most commonly a Jewish woman, not receiving a get from her husband are quite severe. The Jewish religion has coined the term aguna, which, den which denotes a spiritual chaining of the woman to her husband, leaving her soul forever tied to his, despite the dissolu dissolution of the union. Not only does get refusal leave the woman in a state of spiritual imprisonment known as aguna, but halakha dictates that the Jewish woman cannot remarry another Jewish person, and that any children that the Jewish woman will have with another Jew will carry the status of a mumzer, translating to bastard, in perpetuity. In some cases, men will use the granting of gets as leverage to extort money, child custody, or unequal estate distributions in return for the liberation of a woman's aguna. The spiritual, social, and financial implications of aguna are crippling. Now, how does this anecdote about my family member getting a get 40 years after being civilly divorced relate to Agana in Canada? It is important to understand that the Jewish cultural and religious practices vary from community to community and sometimes do, does not abide strictly by Jewish law. Deviations in Jewish practice show us how the Jewish people have morphed and diverged in various ways as they have moved throughout history. My family is more or less secularized and belongs to the liberal Reform Judaism movement. This sect of Jewish religion does not recognize aguna as a halachic problem, as a Jewish woman can receive a Jewish divorce if she so pleases. Since aguna and get refusal is not as common amongst Reform and secular Jews, the necessity for a Jewish divorce along with a civil divorce is less obvious. After 40 years of living separate divorced lives and respectively re remarrying non-Jewish spouses, my family members did not see the inherent need to get a get. They were not toiling in spiritual anguish for 40 years because they were not incredibly pious and they were also in interfaith marriages. So there were no practical halachic ramifications. It was only at my bat mitzvah did they so happen to be in the same room and have convenience of having a trusted reform rabbi to discuss their opinions with. This is not the case for all Jewish people. 
The ways in which different Jewish communities respond to matters of Jewish divorce are vastly different. This makes it especially challenging for Jewish women seeking a Jewish divorce to access support through the Canadian legal system. My research on the Agunah problem has given me a broad qualitative database of testimonies, including my own family's experiences, and has made it quite obvious that there are serious knowledge gaps between Canadian public policy makers and religious actors. To this day, countless Canadian women are living in Agunah. They are spiritually severed from their faith, socially alienated from their communities, unable to create a new family, and in some cases being extorted for money and child benefits. Canadian public policy is not able to guarantee that these women live freely from these aforementioned social problems. Alguna and get abuse are merely the Jewish phenomenon that highlight greater social maladies like gender disparities and oversight of vulnerable populations that plague our society today. In order to safeguard the well-being of Canadian Jewish women, Canadian policymakers and adjudicators should operate with a working knowledge of its religious populations and consult religious educators on relevant issues. Through my research with Dr. Apel Kazmarov and Dr. Butler at Carleton University, I have come to observe another oversight from Canadian policy in regards to religious affairs. Although Canada technically recognizes other forms of law, like English common law and French civil law, it fails to understand the depth in which legal pluralism runs amongst its population. For example, the laws that dictate and guide the day-to-day -day life of a Canadian Orthodox Jewish woman is that of Jewish law, halakha. The Jewish woman only buys meat from a kosher butcher, has intricate systems in place to follow kosher food laws, arranges her weeks to ensure that she keeps the Sabbath, and recites blessings over her meals. Now, my mentor, a revealed academic and law professor, also part of the Canadian conservative Jewish movement, says that the laws in which she follows is halakha primarily, and then Canadian secondarily. She assured me that her legal pluralism is not ranked on the basis of importance, but the basis of the relevancy to her day-to-day -day life. Canadian public policy has not effectively recognized the interplay of the different legal structures its population abides by. This form of policy neglect leaves much room for vulnerable individuals, like Jewish women, in Canadian communities to have their rights jeopardized. After examining the problems of Aguna in Canada and observing how national public policy and law fail to protect all Canadians, I reached a key question. My research question asks, how can Canadian public policymakers protect their religious communities? My research leads me to, pr to propose three solutions to close the religious knowledge gaps in Canadian public policy through increased education, internal capacity building, and the effective utilization of Section 211 in the Divorce Act of 1990. My first solution rests in a matter in which we're all proponents of, and that's education. There's not a structured public policy or piece of legislation that I can prescribe um, that could protect all Canadian women from the terrors of Aguna. As I mentioned earlier, the ways in which Jewish individuals practice and abide by Jewish law are not a monolith. Through ethnographic interviews, I have witnessed the discrepancies in what one rabbi from the conservative denomination deems as legitimate to be disregarded by another rabbi from the ultra-Orthodox denomination. Relying solely on the religious leaders for public policy guidance is a dangerous game when protecting intersectional populations. It is crucial that Canadian policymakers and legal representatives are fully equipped with a holistic knowledge of the communities it presides over, Jewish communities in this case, and the social implica implications policies have on them. A more substantive example of education and informed policy making are by making it mandatory to include annual religious and cultural trainings. My second solution to this problem of non-inclusive Canadian public policy is to build internal capacity within tight-knit religious communities. This past summer, Erman Sharabani, an Orthodox Jewish woman, made headlines through her social media fueled fight against her 10 years of get refusal. Erman was able to garner national support, awareness on the issue, and empower young Orthodox women to use their voice to fight for their rights. Although Erman is still living in Aguna, the impacts of her social media movement, fundraising, and community mobilization are quite powerful. 
If young women in religious communities had access to social media, community organizing, and other empowerment-based training, they will be better equipped to maneuver the tricky interactions with halakha and Canadian policy. But that solution only equips the victims of Aguna. To achieve more breadth of protection of women from get abuse, religious community leaders like rabbis must act deliberately. Now, the state has no business dictating religious practice, but the state does have an obligation to ensure the safety of Canadians. And that is why I'm proposing that another way to strengthen internal capacity building is to apply internal accountability systems for rabbis to use within their expertise. The quality of life for Canadians at large would benefit from the state supporting religious leaders and in instilling accountability and protective tools in their communities. Lastly, I urge Canadian legal bodies to utilize Section 211 of the Divorce Act on a case-by-case -case basis. That way, the law is less likely to be perverted. Drawing from the landmark 1969 case, Rucker v. Markovitz, I will point out how this act initially was meant to protect parties of divorce, but has been used to codify the endangerment of the vulnerable, often female, parties of Jewish divorce. Section 211 allows for a spouse to file an affidavit, an affidavit if the spouse believes that there is a religious barrier to the marriage. That made it so that Mr. Markovitz could argue against fulfilling his religious obligation, which is to give his wife a get, even if it is backed by the state. He successfully used Section 211 to his advantage, claiming a state-enforced get infringes on his religious freedoms. Albeit Section 211 was used in a legal manner, it was not used correctly given that it only further entrenched Mrs. Brucker into her 15 years of aguna. I'm calling on Canadian lawmakers and adjudicators to remain aware and vigilant of the ways in which the laws are, are unjust and do not protect the vulnerable on a case-by-case -case basis. The most salient critiques on bridging knowledge gaps between Canadian public policymakers and religious communities concern themselves with issues of religious freedom. Within reference to Section 2A of Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms and Supreme Court's interpretations of that, these critiques can be rebutted. Canadian public policymakers could provide objections to applying my solutions on the principle of the, dis the distinction of church and state. Although the Christian faith is quite present in Canadian society and institutions and is not very discreet, the state still strives to remain as secular and democratic as it can be. So it's an adequate question. How could Canada continue to, continue to uphold its commitment to respecting individual religious freedoms and liberal democratic values if policy makes itself involved in religious affairs? Now with this question in mind, I'd like to reference the Supreme Court's interpretation of Section 2A of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Fundamental rights and freedoms in Canada are not unlimited. They have been entrenched in the Canadian Constitution to provide a baseline level of protection for the Canadian individual. Now, Section 2 of the Charter lays out the undeniable right to worship without fear of reprisal, and it does not state that this right can be used to justify the denial of the fundamental rights of another individual. The Court has made distinctions in the scope of this fundamental right of religious freedom, depending if it pertains to the, to the individual or the collective. When Canadians are being robbed of their spiritual connection, isolated from social circles, denied the right to have a family, and being financially ma manipulated, the issue transcends one of the collective, regardless of their religion. To conclude this presentation, I will leave you with a quote from a respondent from our interview last year. She is a Canadian Jewish woman, and this is her describing her cathartic experience of finally securing a Jewish divorce. And they said, it's done, you're done. And so we left. I just cried, cried. It was everything all at once. I knew I shouldn't marry him. And thank God it really happened and that I don't have to go through this again and fear the unknown. And now what? But I came back to the JCC and went to the mikvah, and that was an amazing experience. When I came out of the waters, I really felt this second chance, this new feeling, and that I'm sort of cleansed of it all, and no more guilt of having married him or guilt of choosing divorce. No more guilt over, over is this going to scar my child? Okay, now I can start again. And now I get to have this clean slate, at least between me and God. This Canadian Jewish woman was granted a get.
This Canadian Jewish woman was able to return to her religion and ritualistically wash herself of her past. This Canadian Jewish woman had a chance to start anew. Not all Canadian Jewish women can say the same. By closing the knowledge gaps between Canadian public policy and religious affairs, the state can ensure that it is wielding all the power under its rule to protect all Canadian women from abuse. Thank you.